Okay, so uh, high expectations, full crowd, so I hope I won't uh, let you down. Um, so thank you for coming to the talk. So <clears throat> why is finding your organization's code deodorant even interesting? So I'm guessing that most of you care about clean code. That's why you're here in the conference and you're here in the talk. But why isn't is it interesting in the organization level? So coding is a collaborative effort. It's not something that usually we do alone. Unless you're a homicidal coder, you know, working in the woods, you're usually working in a, in a team. And if you try to adopt clean code all by yourself, it's very likely that the number of WTF moments you'll have in a day will only increase and not decrease. So to be honest, uh, we accidentally found our ways of promoting clean code as it was just the side effect of trying to mitigate a serious technical debt issue. But once we found it out, we continued on and continued to improve it because we keep trying to find ways to deliver better and faster. By the end of this presentation, you will all have the option to choose if you're going to take it to the next level and promote clean code within your own organizations. So, my name is Itai Zeitman. Uh, this is my Twitter handle, Itai C. I'm a backend engineering lead at Wix, and before that, I was uh, the so server software infrastructure team lead at Wix, and I'll touch on both of them in a sec. I've been a clean code fanatic for around uh, five, six years now, and I still remember the day that a coworker gave me clean code by Uncle Bob. And I remember reading, reading it on the way home on the bus, and I was mesmerized by, the, the, by Uncle Bob's ability to crystallize such small truth. You know, code should be read like a news item, no comments. And I've uh, started spiraling up and up and up and uh, trying to clean my code every day. Other than that, I'm the proud spouse and uh, father of three amazing daughters. Okay, so uh, who here knows what Wix does? Okay, finally a crowd that doesn't know. So, uh, so Wix is an online uh, website building platform. We're home to over 92 million users. Uh, we, we're around 1,300 employees. And we have around 50, uh, 500 developers. <coughs> Wix's server uh, production topology is, is somewhat eclectic. You can find like a one Erlang service and two no Go and uh, some Python and some Ruby, but that's not our main bread and butter. Our main bread and butter is the JVM, mainly Scala. We have some legacy Java. We have around 250 microservices and around 120 backend developers. We also have around 40 node um, microservices, but those are really fresh and you're st only starting to get traction. Why is this relevant? This is relevant because this is the group, those 120 developers is the, 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 the experiment group, the group that uh, basically went through this transformation. Now, all of this is powered by a common infrastructure, what we call Wix Server Infra, and that is based on some open source framework. You, you all know them, Jetty, Spring, Jackson, and so on and so on. Uh, our own internal framework based on top of that and a lot of libraries. Just to give you a small sense of what this means, this handles RPC, it handles test infrastructure, monitoring, security, service lifecycle, BI, and a host of other things. Uh, this these are around 15, I think today even maybe 25 libraries, and our GitHub repo has around 99 contributors. Maybe it turned into 100 since the last time I edited this slide. Why is this important? It's important because the code base that I was responsible for is this code base, and it's code base that people read in, read day in and day out, and they contribute to it, and they use it. So this is a great opportunity to get, to get people engaged. So our story is from the middle of my journey. And the context is legions of developers asking for features and uh, for changes and for bug fixes from all of these libraries, which were riddled with te technical debt. And I'm maintaining those all by myself. So my manager and I try to think, how can this be sustainable? Both for me, so I won't get worn down and wear out and just leave Wix because, you know, there is a, a limit to how, how much you can work uh, nights and weekends. And for the, the developers, so that they will actually get their features. 
and we decided that if you need a feature, you are asked to contribute it. So unless it's really critical in time or in the, or in the core, we ask you to contribute or have it enter the backlog, and it will come out when, we, when, we have the, when I have the capacity. Now, that really uh, got a lot of backlashes, but that's the topic of another, another talk. So we started that, and it had its ups and downs. And one day, a junior developer needed a feature, and he was requested to contribute, just like everyone else. Now, his contribution was very poor and lacking on all counts of testability, readability, coverage, uh, and, and, and design. And uh, we started to do a few cycles of online and offline code review. And it didn't really drive the message home. So I went to my manager and I told him, hey, what do you want me to do with this? It's taking some time. I'm sorry. And, uh, and he said, I don't care. You need to get everyone to be able to contribute to the infrastructure. If you want to do it, if you want to clean up after him, you can do that. If you want to do code with him, you can do that. You need to decide. And I said, no way am I going to clean up after everyone. So we continued a few more cycles, and I saw it's not coming to an end. And I went to my boss again. I told him, listen, now hurting the deadline of other features. And he said, I don't care. Everyone has to be able to contribute. You find a way. And we continued, and it ended up taking around eight cycles, which was a pretty big investment on my part, because I was all alone. But the end contribution was very clean, very small, and future pull requests from that developer took a lot less cycles and a lot less time. But if the story would end there, we would probably not be talking right now. My big aha moment was that around a week later, I, I met that developer, and he was all excited. He came up to me, he don't know, over the weekend, I wrote a project in, in GitHub, and I, used, I, I did the TDD, and I saw how the APIs, uh, how, I, how the tests tease out the APIs, and how I get confidence from the tests. And I was really excited. First of, first of all, because I love TDD and clean code, and when I see others excited from it, then I'm excited with them, but also because I saw that we worked on one thing, the infrastructure, and it propagated to a whole different area, his home project. And it started to, uh, to dawn on me that maybe we have here a path to spreading clean code. So we found two truths during our journey. The first is that clean code is not going to happen naturally. So Wix is a fast-growing company, both in terms of business and in terms of employees. Now, when we started out, Everyone contributes to the infrastructure. You know, small startup, well, like, it's everyone's responsibility, everyone contributes. But when everyone became an abstract enough notion, it meant no one was responsible. You took a look at the commit log, and you saw these. Now, we all know those cold smells, right? Bad naming, log methods, mixed levels of abstraction. We all know, we all know those. So you saw commits. Most commits were not shameful commits, commits that you take a look and you say, Oh my God, no, he did that? So we also had those commits, but most commits were just commits that you saw the person, the developer, did not put in their A game. Okay, he could have cleaned up more after himself, she could have picked a better name, but they did not do that. And we tried to think, okay, why, why aren't people, good engineers, people that in their own projects, they try to do the best they can, why don't they actually um, do their A game? And we got to the uh, realization that it comes down to two things, context and ownership. Now, I think that these two, code duplication and high coupling, really epitomize. And I, I want to give an example, and then I'll give more, some more context. Let's say we, ha we have two libraries, library A and library B. And you need to add another feature to library B. And you see a few lines in library A that really help you out. What, what, what will you do? You have three options. First option is to copy those few lines from library A to library B, add whatever you need to do, and be done with it. But then we have code duplication. And someone, maybe you, probably not you, will have to fix the bugs, the bug into both places. Other option is to say, OK, let's have library B depend on library A. Right? But then we have high coupling, because library B doesn't really need library A. 
Or you have a third option. You can, you can try and understand what is the common abstraction there, extract the library C, give it the proper name, and have A and B use that. But to do that, you need context. You need to, do what, you need to understand what library A does, what library B does, and what is the shared abstraction of C. And you need to have ownership. Because this extraction of, of, a, of another library or another component or another module is not, is, not, uh, is not zero cost. It has some cost. And now if you are the maintainer of this code base, you are the owner, then it's, it's worthwhile for you to make this investment because it's amortized over time. But if you're just a visitor, then, you know, okay, um, maybe someone else will do it. Because when you, whenever you go into a code base and you go in, you know, once a few, every few months, then the bad code you see is usually someone else's. It's not yours. That other developer, he made the boo-boo. But you know, like, your code was excellent. So, by the way, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Adam's talk at, at the, uh, on the morning, but he was also talking about a very similar thing, about uh, relationship between ownership and code quality. So I highly suggest watching it, and he links also to a good essay there. So our second realization was that you have to face it head on. Because even if every commit contained a small amount of code smells, then these add up and become landmines. We all know that landmines tend to blow up when we least have the time to expect them. OK, so here's how we, ha how we tackled it. Number one, clean your own code. I decided to start by raising the bar myself. Now, what do I mean by raising the bar? I'm, I don't mean that my code was perfect. I'm sure that you all know the situation where you take a look at your code that you wrote six months ago, a year ago, and you take a look and you say, oh my god, no, did I wrote that? Why did I use this pattern? It's totally wrong. Or what did I think? This test name is completely uh, unclear. So guilty, same. But the standard I put for myself was that the day I push, I know this is the best I can do. So I'm sure you know the, the situation where you say, oh, yeah, I'm not sure about, about this level of abstraction. Or maybe I should clean up this test a bit more or rename this variable. But I'm not sure what to do. Maybe I should go and consult with someone. Uh, no, I don't really have the time. Uh, the product is pushing me, and so on and so on. And so I'll push, and I'll, I'll clean it afterwards. So, I said, this will not happen. I will start by raising the bar and only push when I feel that this is the best I can do. Now, of course, every rule has exceptions. And uh, even though th this, this is shared infrastructure, so it's somewhat buffered from production, we still have production-related issue. And when you have production-related issue, you first and foremost fix it. But even then, the task is not done before I finish cleaning it up. So I push, and then I clean. And no matter how, fresh, how uh, important the next feature is, I finish cleaning up. But how is that related to promoting clean code? That, that's just clean code, right? It's related because first, others read your code. And uh, it doesn't matter if, if, this, if this is the, the infrastructure where many people read the code, or just as part of a team where others read your code, because they start to see what's the standard that you put for yourself. And they start to implicitly understand what you expect of them. It, the, you, you start to actually put mirrors in the code. And when someone sees that you've cleaned up after them, he says, oh, yeah, that is the variable name that I was expecting. Or, oh my god, this cleanup? Interesting. I never saw this pattern. So you start basically uh, removing the landmines and putting in small signs of Okay, hey, this is clean, and people start taking notice. More importantly, you walk the talk. You can't expect to mentor or to code review or to pair with someone and lecture them about this and that without actually doing it. When I do a code review for someone and I tell them, hey, why do you have this code duplication? And they tell me, what? One line? Wow, are you really talking to me about one line? 
And I can tell them, hey, go to look at this place and see how, when I extracted that one line from the two places, then it actually uh, gave a, uh, another level of abstraction. And take a look at the other place where I fixed a bug in both places and, uh, and, and I extracted the one line. And you can also take a look at the third place where I did not extract that duplication because it, the abstraction wasn't clear, so I waited for the third occurrence. When you actually do it, you are able to have a more educated discussion about code and not only about beliefs. So, okay, we did that, but like I told you, dirty code contributions still kept coming in. So we understood that we have to harness the contributions. But we saw three things. The first is that if it's not clean before the push, it will never be clean. I started off by adding uh, post-push email notifications and just read through all the code that was being pushed. And I, I, went, I went to people and I told them, hey, I saw that you uh, added this and this. Thanks, amazing. Uh, what do you think about doing just this small change and maybe adding that, uh, that test? And people were very, very receptive, but they never had the time because they were always busy with their next feature. So I understood that I have to be the gatekeeper of good contributions. I closed off pushes to master and moved to, to pull requests. Now, that stored up a hornet's nest because people were very, very upset from saying, hey, uh, what, you think you're much a better programmer than, my, than, than I am and you don't want my, my contribution, or people saying, you, you think that your code base is so pristine and uh, you, don't want, you don't want me to litter your code base. And it, it, it took a process. It took a process to explain to people why are we doing it. Explain to them that it's not, it's not a, uh, a control issue, but it's actually uh, trying to keep us afloat. Now, it will be funny to, to, to hear to some people, but the first and foremost was to explain to people how to technically work with it, how to do, how to do pull requests from the command line, from, from IntelliJ, from, uh, from the UI. What do I need to do? If I, uh, if, if, I, if I get uh, comments, how can I add to the pull request? Note, you can just push to the branch, but people did not know that, right? Well, before GitHub uh, introduced uh, uh, squashing, then we had to explain to people, how do you squash on the branch so that we'll not get your filthy 15 commits? But only to do that but, uh, but af after we do the, the code review. Now, you know, these sound trivial, but when you change someone's tool set, you need to lend them a hand. You want to lower the entry barrier so it will be easier for them to understand that it's not just you playing control games, but, uh, but, but there is a higher value. And for that, you are also uh, willing to put in the effort. But even, even uh, 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 in the face of this significance, like always, the big problem was people, okay? And this took a, took a process of talking to people, explaining to them that it's not that I think I'm a better developer, but I am the owner of the code base, like they are the owner of their code base, and that I will not come and start pushing a lot of code into their code base without talking to them. That it's not that the code base is pristine, other, but on the contrary, it's so dirty that we can't have yet more uh, mess in there. So we have to close it off. Now, like always, there, was, uh, there, there were people that were not convinced, but most people bought in. But then we understood the contributions have to be sustainable because a backlog began forming up. Now, first of all, for you, because if you keep eight, 10 iterations on a pull request per developer over time, you will not get any work done. So what you want to do is you want to find a way to have, uh, uh, to, to minimize the number of cycles per developer over time. For them, because if the contributor feels that, you know, they are just getting jerked around every time, then they will not want to contribute. Right? They will start using reflection or whatever they need to do to get around your limitations. We you know developers, they do what they need to do. Now, 
this does not, if, if, if you do not try to understand how contributions are sustainable for the contributors, you are creating a hostile environment. So promoting clean code should not, should not be, uh, should not create a hostile environment. What does it mean for us? It meant for us establishing a conversation. It meant talking about why, it, it, it first of all meant suggesting changes and not just saying A to B, fix this, add tests, so on, so on, so on. It meant suggesting changes. It meant explaining the motivation. Hey, do you see that if you each re rename this variable to this variable, it actually clarifies the, the abstraction or the responsibility of this code. It meant talking about how things are done and not only about the end result. Because if I see someone not doing TDD and I don't talk to them about it, then next pull request, they will still not be doing TDD because they don't understand the value of it. But if I go in and tell them, hey, do you see this API? If you would have tried to dri 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 drive it from a test, then you would have seen that this API is cumbersome, like we now agree. So maybe we should try and delete this code and together try and, uh, and drive it again. Most importantly, it meant allowing a conversation so that both the reviewer and the contributor feel content. The reviewer has to feel content because um, it's their code base. After all, they will be the one waking up when there is a problem, fixing and cleaning over time. And you have to remember, it's not open source. 99% of these contributions will get in because they have, they have a real uh, need and it's not imaginary and people need to advance. The contributor has to feel content because otherwise they will not come back and you will, leave, you, 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 you will basically deplete your organizational credit. I once heard from someone that uh, he felt that the reviewer just sat on his keyboard and typed and de deleted everything and typed uh, in his behalf. Now, it wasn't physically, but because the reviewer did not establish a conversation, but rather commanded the contribution and just told him this, 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 for every small detail, that developer just felt, yeah, okay, you know what, T take, take the keyboard and do whatever you want, because like, m my opinion doesn't really matter here. And that is not the mindset that you want people to have. So in order to, to help people understand what constitutes a good contribution, we try to identify some key elements. Number one, less is more. So for us it meant that the contribution should help several projects. If you just have a cool feature that you think will be awesome for the infra, please don't contribute. If you have something that, hey, yeah, this is technical, it's not related to my business logic, uh, let's, let's put it in the infra. Please keep it in your own project. Or convince others that they actually need your code and they don't understand. This is what's called a duplication of the second degree, right? It's not the same code, but it solves the same problem. This is awesome. I once had a, a developer came up to me and tell me, hey, I need this, uh, this and this, uh, I have this, this uh, utility, and I think it's, uh, it, it should be common. I told him, no one talked to me about it. I'm not sure that uh, it's actually common. And he told me, I'm telling you, people need it. I told him, you know what? Awesome. Please go and find other use cases and, and convince people that your solution actually helps them. And he went and found a couple of people, a couple of projects that already have similar uh, implementations, two had, and one was about to write, and he generalized his solution and contributed it. And that was amazing because it removed code duplication and helped a new project not waste time. But this, without the pushback, what, would, what, what, what we just have gotten is one library sitting in the infra, no one knowing about it, and other libraries sitting in the, in, in, in the business layers. Number two, you ain't gonna need it. E that the contribution should get in, contribute the list code possible and add features later. We all know those 15 amazing features that no one will actually use, but hey, it's generic, this is what we need. And then when you go six months later, a year later, and you wanna remove a method, or you wanna change the behavior, you, you're not sure what's happening. Can I change it? What will happen? So we ask, please, 
let's only contribute what we know we need and add other features later. Now, yeah, this might contradict with stable APIs, but uh, this is a trade-off that we're making day in and day out. The Boy Scout rule. So, who, 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 who here doesn't know the Boy Scout rule? Excellent. Okay, so the Boy Scout rule, uh, it's actually from the Boy Scouts, and it talks about always leaving the campground cleaner. After you go, and, uh, you, you go hiking or whatever, you should leave the campground not only clean up your mess, but only also clean up some, some, mess, some mess that was before. So contributions leave existing libraries code cleaner. Now this talks about local changes. Okay, I've had people refactor the whole library. They just rewrite it. Yes, okay, it was messy. Here is the new library. But now you don't actually understand what's happening there. So good changes are maybe extracting a private method, rename a, uh, rename a variable, renaming a test from talking about how the implementation uh, actually is to why, what's the feature that we're driving. Now, these this is one of the key elements in removing and reducing clean, uh, uh, technical debt over time. TDD. Every API has a purpose and was driven by a test. When we talk about TDD, we talk about outside-in TDD, goose-style uh, TDD. Why? Why is this important? First of all, because we want to know why things were driven. Why? Okay, if you have a lot of code that not, nothing uses, can you remove it? What will happen if you remove it? You don't know. Second of all, we want the, the design not to come from your imaginaries, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, from, from your dreams, because of course you are amazing developers, but the other person that will contribute without this, they will just write a, 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 a bad API. So we want this to be driven by a test. Now, Wix is uh, very loose, and there are very few things that people have to do. So, uh, although the vast majority of people in the backend engineering do TDD, some people don't. So even then, we require regression confidence. This means that we have to have 100% confidence, or we won't accept your, your pull request. Now, for us, uh, we, we saw that for a mid-size contribution and up, it's not, it, it's, it's very unlikely for this to happen uh, if it wasn't driven by TDD. But we're always open to the discussion, so, um, you know, we take it on, on a case-by-case -case basis. And by the way, if, if you're wondering, after you, you do TDD enough, you, it's very easy to know when a code was driven by tests or not when they were tacked on afterwards. Again, I'm not talking about five lines and you know into tests, I'm talking about a more significant contribution. Okay, this slide is so important that I wanted to put here all the key contributions. And I'll take a few seconds for you to tweet it out, send it to your coworkers. This is how to get started with uh, key contributions. And oh, one last. Okay. So, the third tool. Funny enough, we discovered this tool only after the fact, mentoring. Okay, we found ourselves doing it without noticing. But wh what do we mean by mentoring? Because as you know, mentoring is overloaded term. Uh, one of the most overloaded, like Agile, Scrum, OOP, we have a tendency of overloading. So I'll explain what I mean. So this talks about uh, ongoing mentorships. When we get someone new into the team, they are basically brainwashed and indoctrinized so that they will know what is accepted inside the team? What do we mean by clean code? What do we mean by TDD? It doesn't mean that you uh, put on a few tests. How you do TDD, how you get the design feedback from the test. Why? First of all, because we believe that these practices are uh, what makes a good team, or at least a big part of what makes a good team. The ability to agree, the ability to work together, be, be it pairing, be it code review, 
of different code and just being rotating on the code base. But the big impact is not this ongoing mentorship. It's the one time off. Because like I said, this code base is code base that people read day in and day out. And we found that actually people come and they, uh, they have a lot of dilemmas. Hey, how can I use this feature from the framework? Or maybe I'm using the same library that you're using. Can you give me a few tips? And we actually had, had a sign on the door that says, if you want help, don't come without your laptop. And people started coming with the laptops, and that enabled mentorship, which is one time off and about the code. Okay, because you first and foremost help the person with whatever they need, right? It's not, it's not only wasting their time. It's getting them the value that they need, but then also asking them a, qu a small question. Hey, wh why is this test uh, um, named like this is? Do you understand what, 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 what's the business value? Because I don't understand. Or what do you think about actually moving this duplication? And um, when you try to explain to people, and do it with them. So actually tell them, hey, what do you think about renaming this test? And just pairing with them for 10 minutes, five minutes, 30 minutes. This goes a long way into getting buy-in, into getting people to feel that it's not only your pristine code base that you care about, but also their code base, also the engineering of the whole organization. OK. But the question arises, did we have to use the infra to promote clean code? A friend came to me and said, you know what, you're just bullshitting. Basically, uh, the infra team has the best developers, and that's why, uh, th that's why you promote clean code. And I had to think about it. Is he actually correct? And my answer was that he, he was mistaken. Now, of course, to work on the infra and to write the infra, you have to have used a few libraries. So the ratio of seasoned developers inside that team is very, very high. But those seasoned developers are just the seasoned developers that we have in other teams. All, only those also have some juniors and some mid. The real change was that we decided that uh, we will be measuring ourselves according to the cleanliness of our code and the cleanliness of code that uh, people use from us. The cleanliness of, uh, and, and, and the discussion that we will have with people. Now, yes, this specifically, because we put it in on such a high priority, and it took a lot of time from the team, required management's backing. But there are various ways to do it. So how can you take it from here? So first of all, face it head on. Understand that you have a problem. Second, make it a priority. This will not be solved if you do a code retreat once a year and talk to people about cleaning the code. Or, you know, every quarter doing some retrospective and saying, hey, why don't we have enough test coverage? No, this has to be a priority. Now, priority doesn't mean that that's what you do. We deliver. That's first and foremost, we deliver value to our customers. But we also balance this because this, for us, is our ability to deliver value over time. The third thing is to find your own tools. For us, it meant cleaning your own code, it meant harnessing contributions, and mentorship. Questions? Okay, we have priority, but we, we, we have time for both the slide do and questions. Yeah. From well, one more. Yeah, it works. So we have two questions on Slido. Mm -hmm. And first one is how much time and effort does it take for each new hire to introduce this process, I guess, and uh, um, to get them in? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, so of, of course. Uh, the, the, the answer is uh, the usual suspect, it depends. So it, 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 it depends on uh, how experienced the, the developer um, and you know, how, how much you do they already know. And that can sometimes be a plus or a minus. You know, sometimes people know, yes, this is TDD, and now you have to undo what they know. Um, but the cost is not high when 
you uh, are not that high at least when you uh, when when you do it mostly via pair programming. So when you do it via pair programming and via code review, so you tell the person, hey, this task, assume that it will take you time and assume that we might be uh, deleting most of the code each day. Okay, most of the new code might be deleted each day, but that is not because uh, you are incompetent, but this, this is the way we basically pay for your training. We at least believe that uh, our uh, biggest asset is people, and because we aim at uh, hiring them for many years, then we are good with paying uh, some dividend at least at the beginning to hire them. Okay. To train them, sorry. Yeah. Uh, do you need to argue with the business why clean code takes time, or and or why features take longer to implement? Uh, and, you know, and, and, what, what, and what, most importantly, what, what, what are the arguments that you use to convince mm -hmm, the business? Mm -hmm. So f first of all, who, who here knows uh, Uncle Bob's uh, argument about uh, doctors and uh, wa washing their hands? Okay, very few people. So, so I'll, I'll reiterate. Um, you know, Uncle Bob says that, okay, would you, would you rather uh, your doctor to say, oh, I don't, have to, I, I don't have time to wash the hands, I have to go into surgery? No, you want them to wash their hands, right? So, uh, very similarly, there are things that are not part of the discussion with the business and with respect to the fact that clean code is the way you need to perform your, your profession. Now, this is of course somewhat of a, uh, of, of a, of a you know, broad stroke. In the finer details, we, around five or six years ago, we, uh, we took three months to cut a release, and then three months to stabilize it on production, okay? Each release m demanded a war room and people losing, losing sleep. And this was a very, very bad uh, time for us. And the chief architect went, went to, to manage and told them, do you want uh, the ability to uh, deliver endless stream of features into production? And they said, yes. And then he told them, okay, do you want the ability to react to market changes? And they told him, yes. And he said, okay, then what we need to do is we need to, to be able to continuously deliver. To do that, we need to have high confidence about the code. That is, that is very simple. We need to be able to know, automatically know, that the code works. And for that, we need to do TDD. That's it. The reason, the reason that we're doing clean code and TDD is not because we are philosophers that love to clean the code. It's because we see the business value of clean code and TDD and we have expressed it and management sees it. Okay, Wix now changes production a hundred times a day. Three months, a hundred times a day. Okay, we had less than 2% of rollbacks. Uh, production changes is not only deployment, it's also feature targets, A-B tests, which actually means, you know, um, also code, code branches being activated. Uh, 2015, we had less than 2% of rollbacks. So we had very, very little DOAs. That's because we have a high confidence rate about our code. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, question, and then the next question is, is anyone review, reviewing your pull requests, or are you just pushing directly to, to master? Good question, good question. So, uh, so w w when I started out, I was alone, and no one, uh, no one reviewed it. I, like, uh, very seldomly, I, I went to people, you know, and, and basically dragged them in and told them, hey, can you please look at my code? I'm not sure, I want some opinion. Uh, but it was hard because like I said, they don't have the context. Uh, when the team grew, because it took us a lot of time, it took me a year to recruit, because as you know, recruiting is hard, finding good people is hard. By the way, we are hiring in Lithuania. If you wanna relocate, talk to me afterwards. Uh, but uh, definitely, when, we, when uh, we moved, then we started reviewing. So, but that was uh, on an opt-in level and a, a bit before I left the team, then we actually started doing a code review for all code that was going in. But 
In general at Wix, I can't say code review is, is mandatory. So I would say around a quarter of the teams do it. That's around it. Okay. Uh, yeah, next question is how do you resolve problems if new developer doesn't agree on some code, clean code principles, like for example, he wants to write a lot of commands, I don't know. Um, okay, so, so in, in, in general, we, like I said, we're very loose. We believe that most things need to be uh, agreed on on the team level. So uh, we, we, we have, uh, have uh, cross-functional teams, okay, we call them companies, and they are like small startups. Now, um, that group of people needs to agree, okay? This is their home, this is their communal home. You have to, you have, you have to, you have to agree, and you would, you, you should spend hours if, if you disagree. If, um, and, and, and uh, so if the disagreement is within the team, then usually what we say to that person is, okay, you know, if, if like, of course we, we, we discuss and discuss, and there's no agreement, then we tell them, okay, please take the time, try how we work, and let's talk about it again in two weeks, in two, in, uh, two weeks, in four weeks, and then we can talk about actual facts. You can, you can say, hey, you know that you dro dro drove this feature via TDD, and what, now we pay for that, and ta, ta 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 So he might actually change the team. But uh, if there is no agreement, then that person is, is required to, to align. If we're talking about between teams, it's very simple. This is my house, please obey my rules. Okay, next question. Uh, how do you actually do the code review? Is it happening remotely or do you do it in person? Uh, uh, both. So we, we're distributed. We have offices in, uh, in Israel, in Tel Aviv and Beersheba, and in Lithuania and in uh, Ukraine, in Kiev and Dnipro. So it, it depends. Um, it, 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 so we basically mix and match. Um, we, we think that there is a lot of value in offline code review, but... Um, but also, like, the big value of online code review is that people can uh, respond more clearly, okay? They don't have to now feel like they are uh, blamed and, you know, the, the person sits next to them and why, why did you do this, why did you do that? It might be fine to hear, but GitHub's change, now that you can uh, get one email per comment and not 15, was a huge, huge gain. Because when people got 15 emails, the changes, they, they felt attacked. They felt, oh my God, that person thinks my code is shit. But no, hey, like, there are 15 small issues. When, when, when you can actually start a review and you just get one email, it, it, it really uh, improved the relationship between the, the reviewer and the contributor. Yeah, uh, you were talking about like, good contributions and how much time did it take for your company to get from like, bad contributions to healthy contributions? So, um, it, it, it's, it's a hard question because, because like I said, we, are, are you there actually? Um, yeah. So okay. So let, let's 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 uh, let's talk about you know what's what's a, like what's the probability of a good contribution? Because like I said, we 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 grew, we grew from 15 to 120 in three years, three and a half years. Okay. Uh, this means that new people keep coming in and they need to be be taught and so on and so on. Um, most, I would say, I don't know, like 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of contributions uh, come in, in in a good shape, in a shape that you like that the, the conversation is, um, um, you know, is about like the the last 10 percent, and not about, oh my God, I don't believe I now have to review this code. For most people, again, there are some people, you know, that they are hard. Yeah. Uh, last question I see on Slido, oh no, two more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you use any static code analysis tools like SonarCube or? No. No. no? Why? Uh, why? Because, uh, because we, we don't really believe in metrics. We, we think that uh, uh, developers will game whichever metric they need. Um, so we, what, what, what we think does have value but not enough for us to actually invest. Like if, if someone will want to, then we'll probably welcome it. Is metrics to see a trend, okay? Just as a rough trend without any meaning to the numbers, I do think this, this has value. But, um, but our metric is, 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 is simple. We work inside the code base. You know which parts you don't want to go in, 
and which parts uh, you are very comfortable. And ad again, like Adam uh, said, said uh, like in the morning, um, if, if it's a part that I never go back to, then I will probably not invest more time in cleaning it. So it's, it's just a matter of day to day. Yeah, well, now it's last question, unless some okay. time's more. Uh, how do you do TDD with CSS? Uh, okay. <laughs> Good question, but I, I don't really have the, the answer. So, uh, like I said, Wix is pretty separate with respect to front end and, and back end. So, we have some uh, very uh, like, uh, special developers that decide they want to get the punishment of both back end and front end, but, mo but most uh, developers uh, are affiliated. And I haven't touched CSS for Six years, seven years. So I don't really have a good answer, I'm sorry. Uh, my question would be, how do you know that your version of clean code is the, the uh, version of, uh, of clean code? Uh, because I know that uh, there are different uh, ways of doing that. There are different people looking at, at different things. And there is actually not a, a golden rule uh, what the clean code uh, means. So how do you uh, also improve? I agree. So uh, so the, the first question I would ask you is, th th does it even matter if, if my version is the clean code? Uh, I'm not sure. I, um, I, 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 th I think that there is a huge gain uh, in, in uniformity and in the ability to read the code and, and have, it, uh, have it be fluid. Um, uh, with respect to the second question, uh, which w was maybe your main point about how do I improve. So I definitely, I spend uh, some portion of my time talking about code, reading and, and discussing with people. So, you know, I try hard not to come with, um, with predefined answers. Like I said, not to say, change this, change this, change, change. But, but to say, what do you think about this? And wait for, wait for the response. The response might actually convince me. Yes, of course, you know, I'm, I'm being honest. Most times, uh, m most, most times the response is, is okay, I'll change it. But um, I have definitely uh, been, be, been convinced many times by, uh, by, by developers that either this is, you know, in the gray area and like their version is, 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 uh, is, is okay as mine. And of course, I've, I've changed my, my practices over time. So it, it's not, like I don't have a Bible that I walk around, you know, and I, I hit people with the head. Hey, if you don't do this, then, then, then you're wrong. And it's like, it's, it's, it's art. That's what I believe at least, that what we do is, is art. And so, uh, you know, there's a palette. This is like, this is how it comes out and it changes over time. No, oh, one question there. Okay, speaking about your personal time, you have just a bit touched the topic. So, um, how much time do you, did you start to spend uh, starting from this initiative of uh, pull requests? Uh, and like until the period of uh, when you uh, consider that the stable period, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, okay, so um, I, I, I would say that at the beginning it was, it was between 10%, maybe 20% of the time. Um, <clears throat> now, currently, currently I would say it's around 10%, but the, the context that you have to remember is that first of all, that time is not waste because it's, it's also uh, like new features that come into the code base that maybe would not have come if like people would not have contributed, that's one. Second of all is that uh, we grew from 15 to 120 and from one to four. So uh, like the, the team has not grown like the entire group and so it's not like that uh, the you know, of, of, of t spending time has, has decreased. Also, we, we try very hard. Like I said, you know, my, my manager told me I want everyone to be able to contribute. So at Wix, 20% of your time is allocated to uh, working on non-day-to-day. -day. One of the manifestations of that is that uh, a week, a quarter, you work on uh, you work on a different uh, space with someone pair programming, usually on infra tasks. 
So that brought another new tax to that team, but for us it, brent, it were like generated a ton of value. So. Okay, I guess we're running out of time, actually. Uh, one last question. Okay. Yes. Uh, does your critical bug account decrease after this? Is it practical for you, for your project? Um, yes, so yes, de definitely. The, 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 the number of times where I, uh, where I was surprised, yes, definitely. We, we had, over the past few years, we had two times where we uh, actually found a bug on production, maybe three times, maybe three times. What? Yeah, you, no, over the past three years, okay? Over the past three years, around two, maybe three uh, bugs, okay? No, like, again, found them and respect we had to roll back. So, um, clean code is like deodorant. If you don't use it, your coworkers will hate you. Thank you. Thank you.